friends. This is the 20th episode and I think we will probably end the current series with this one. So let me uh, do a summing up of eight main points. But before I go to that, let me say a few things. First of all, um, this whole series is really about the practice of diplomacy. That is quite different from academic teaching, which essentially focuses on the theories of diplomacy, theories of international relations. Now, diplomacy is essentially, it exists only in practice. In my view, there can't really be a theory of diplomacy, although there are scholars who have tried to create these kind of theories. Uh, I think they are a little bit contrived, but that's a personal view. Perhaps one reason that academics don't get into the practice of diplomacy is because that's not a subject with which they are at all familiar. They are not practitioners. And practitioners are mainly not accepted as academics. So we are left with a little bit of a dilemma. Okay, having got that off my chest, let me talk about two things that I perhaps didn't address in my uh, previous episodes. One is a concept in negotiation which is quite important, and that is the concept of ripe moment. Uh, it was advanced in the 16th century, as far, as far back as that, by an Italian called Giovanni Giardini, and he spoke of the ripe moment. Basically to say that when a negotiation is moving well, it comes to a point where everything is ready to be packaged together. And that is the right moment. Now, how do we know there is a right moment? Well, this is not Hollywood. Gongs don't sound and bugles don't play. But the people involved in the negotiation intuitively through their mutual confidence, begin to understand that we are at a critical final stage. That's where the final concessions, the final deal is put together. Does it happen? Yes, there are examples. For example, the Camp David talks of December 1970, uh, uh, 1999 between um, which President Clinton had sponsored between Israel and Palestine, didn't come to a successful conclusion because the two sides didn't believe that they'd reached the right moment. They couldn't trust each other. The second broad point I want to make is that the uh, existence of a pair of embassies is like a double entry bookkeeping system used by a bank. That idea was first put forward by a good friend, a former foreign minister of Malta, a distinguished lawyer by the name of Dr. Alex Trigona. And he said that like with the double entry system in banks, it provides a parallel channel, a second channel to cross check on information. So what are the two channels? your own ambassador in the foreign capital and the foreign country's ambassador in your capital. And it is a matter of craft skill to know which one is best used in which situation. So let me get to my eight big points. First of all, foreign ministries must plan. I mentioned this in earlier episodes. There must be uh, articulated clear set of strategic objectives and cascaded from this two lower levels, namely goals. For each objective, there may be several goals. And for each goal, there will be a number of targets. Now, typically, the strategic documents as uh, objectives is a short document that is put in the public space. The goals may or may not be put out openly, but the targets are essentially part of an internal process. 
This is a methodical way for a foreign ministry to plan. The second method is, I think I mentioned it earlier, to identify, say, 30 odd countries, which are the priority countries, make a plan for each, a forward plan covering the next three to five years to say, where do we want to go in that relationship? And this would be not a plan of the foreign ministry, but of the entire government. All relevant ministries should be on board. A few countries do this. It's an excellent method. A third method is the French system of an ambassador's instructions, where every ambassador is given, before the ambassador goes to take up her or his post, a clear set of objectives as set out by the national government. Not the foreign ministry but the entire government. And then the ambassador works on that, prepares a plan of action to implement those. My second big point is that diplomacy is a process. It is a collection of events, but the events are interlinked. So in this process, it is important to work to those large continuous objectives. Of course, assessing them from time to time and uh, moving forward on those. My second big point is that methods change all the time. Public diplomacy is an example. Uh, public diplomacy did not exist as a practice 30 years ago. But because now non-state actors are very important players in the whole process. That is, diplomacy has now been, in a way, democratized. There are many state and non-state actors involved. Public diplomacy tries to reach out to foreign publics and home publics. So, a second example of a new practice is the application of information technology, use of the social media. Now, it has a transformative effect, but the basics of diplomacy are still the same. Building of trust, creation of connections which are enduring and which work to the advantage of both sides, particularly the home country. Famous journalist Edward Murrow said that in connecting with anyone, connecting with any entity, the most critical distance is the last three or four feet. And that connection is only made by individuals, by people who look into each other's eyes and say, OK, I understand this man. I can speak to this lady. She will appreciate the points I'm trying to cover. That is where trust is built. And that remains constant all the time. My next point. It's a big point, my fourth point. Diplomacy is a profession. Now, unlike, say, law, where you need a bar council license to practice law, if you are an academic, you need a doctorate if anybody is going to take you seriously as an academic. But anyone can be a diplomat. Isn't that the case in a number of countries where presidents, prime ministers appoint failed politicians, appoint uh, exhausted civil servants, or their cronies as ambassadors. Now, that is a sad commentary because diplomacy is a profession. It involves skill sets. It involves experience. It involves building up of personal skills and knowledge. And that can't all be thrown away if uh, a senior official in a foreign ministry is parachuted into that ministry simply because that person happens to be somebody's friend. Or in the case of the United States, openly, because that person happens to be a financial contributor to the presidential campaign, which means that these are jobs that are for sale. Now, mind you, there are non-career ambassadors, senior officials, who make a great success. These are public figures. These are people who have a broad understanding <coughs> of the world <coughs> of international affairs and diplomacy. 
I have nothing against them at all. But essentially, diplomacy is a profession and it must be nurtured as a profession. People enter as young new entrants, recruited into the process. They acquire skills and experience and the rewards of the service come at a later stage in their careers. We talked of new entrants. How do we handle them? How do we look after them? How do we train them? How do we motivate them? How do we ensure that embassies, which are located far away in different situations, that embassies work to a united purpose, that they are not riven by internal disputes and factions. So, it is very important to manage the human resources carefully. And that, again, is one of the core tasks of the foreign ministry. In India, we do this very well. The foreign secretary, who is the senior most official of the ministry, is called the head of the foreign service in black and white. And that official, she or he, carries responsibility for the orderly operation of the entire diplomatic service, the Indian Foreign Service, as we call it. Not every country has that kind of a practice. My sixth point is continuous learning. The Foreign Ministry should be an institution where at every critical stage officials receive training, receive information, participate in seminars, in workshops that relate to the work that they will be doing. Ambassadors also need training, not classroom training, obviously. These will really be in the nature of workshops where they will address common tasks. A very good device for training, quote-unquote, is the annual conference of ambassadors. Most countries now have that kind of an annual conference. Mexico makes sure that their ambassadors come to the annual conference on their annual holiday at the festive season in December. So they don't pay them extra. They simply say, you come on leave but you are invited to spend three or four days at an ambassador's conference. It's voluntary, but nobody skips it because it's important. Now, at these ambassador conferences, one can engage in workshops, in seminar type of discussions, where again, a learning element, a, a, an experience sharing uh, method is built into the process. My next point, seven, is the diplomat today has to go out in the field. It is not enough to say, I fly the flag, I will sit back in my office and I'll wait for the world to come to me. That doesn't happen. Especially because non-state actors are so important. It is vital for an ambassador to go out. It is vital for an ambassador to go and make connections. Um, I'll give you two examples. Uh, in the 70s, Kenya sent to Paris a rather astute, fine diplomat, Bethwell Kiplagat. I got to know him very well. Mr. Kiplagat, on reaching Paris, sought out the Somali ambassador and he said, I have just arrived day before yesterday and you are the first ambassador I come to call. Technically, I should call on the dean of the diplomatic corps, but I am coming to see you even before I go to the dean because Somalia is Kenya's most important neighbor and partner. Now, those were the days when Kenya and Somalia had problems, had difficulties, had potential for conflict and war. And these two envoys built personal connections, of course, in the Kenyan case with the approval of his foreign ministry, with his president, who had empowered him to go and do that. But this work was entrusted to the ambassador 
who then began a process of bridge building with Somalia. And that story has a lovely ending, which I will not get into, uh, because it, is, it features in a collection of narratives put together uh, in a book published in Nairobi, I think around 2010 perhaps. And that book is available, uh, maybe hidden away somewhere on the foreign ministry website, and that's called Kenya's Early Diplomacy. My second example is even more pertinent. Another newly appointed High Commissioner in uh, London representing Namibia by the name of uh, High Commissioner Ambassador Engwete in London, fairly soon after he presented his credentials to the Queen, he asked the Foreign Office if he could visit Northern Ireland. That was in 1995. The Good Friday Agreement of 1998 had not yet been signed. There was still potential for conflict. There were occasional acts of terrorism. But the High Commissioner said, it is my job to understand what happens in the country where I'm based. And Northern Ireland is an important part of Britain. And I should go and visit Northern Ireland. And one of the very few ambassadors who had the courage to go to Northern Ireland at that time. Well, this had an interesting result. A few months later, he received a personal invitation for the High Commissioner and his wife to have dinner with the Queen at Windsor Castle. And when such a thing happens um, in Britain, a court circular gives the names of people who have been invited by the Queen, who have met the Queen, who have had lunch with her or dinner with her or whatever. When this news came out, there was a sense of uh, amazement in the London diplomatic corps. There were some ambassadors from Latin America and from elsewhere who had served in London for 20 years and more. And they said, you know, we tried so hard to get such an invitation, but we never got it. How did you manage it? You just came seven, eight months ago, and here you are invited to have dinner with the Queen. And um, Ambassador Engwete simply smiled and he said, well, maybe I just got lucky. He didn't narrate the whole story because he was not a person given to boasting. My point in this is these are all ways in which a person moves forward, advances his country's interests. My very last point is the Foreign Ministry is a learning organization. It's an organization where there has to be an effort to collect information, to manage knowledge, and to empower its officials with information. Thanks to digital technology, it is, this is quite easy to do, and it should be done. So I'm at the end of my little talk. Let me just say one little word about the COVID pandemic that we all face and ways in which it might possibly change diplomacy. There are some who believe that multilateral cooperation will become stronger. That's a nice thought. We all wish that would happen. But I'm not so confident that countries will overcome the temptation to assert their national interests. The other consequence of this COVID pandemic will probably be that bilateral cooperation will be more important than ever before. Also regional and perhaps multilateral as well. So there are positives, but there are question marks and we don't exactly know what will happen. Um, some of the stories I've narrated, the large points I've made in this, are included in the final chapter of my memoir. And in the text that accompanies this narrative, this little talk of mine, I will give a, a link to that that is available for free, for free download. So friends, I hope you have enjoyed this. I hope this series has been of some utility to you on the practice of contemporary diplomacy.
Thank you very much. Thank you.